<clears throat> okay, uh, good morning everybody. This is Mark Whistler. Thank you so much, FX Street, and uh, coming to you today from fxvolatility.com. And it's good to see everybody in the room today, all of the great diehard Forex fans. Uh, it sure is, uh, it sure is a, a crazy week, and it's going to get a little bit more interesting. Uh, we're going to go over um, some pretty neat stuff today. We are going to uh, cover volatility and probability in no time has uh, this subject been better in terms of Forex. So I'm truly excited to share this information with you today. Um, also, uh, Maud has um, been so kind as to uh, uh, replace uh, the two volatility and probability reports that I previously wrote in September. Uh, on FX Street, and you can find those. I believe that uh, Mod, uh, if you could post those links, that would be great. And um, I just want to make a, a quick reminder that uh, at no time and in today's webinar is um, anything that we discuss a direct recommendation to buy or sell. Today's webinar is for educational purposes only. Whenever possible, I will be trading live in real time today to show you that the information that you receive. Uh, is not just that of 2020 hindsight. Anybody can look at a chart and say when and where you should have bought and sold, but be able to digest uh, and to uh, put information into, into action in real time is a whole different ball of wax. So we will attempt to do that. It's important to note that the account that I will be trading is hypothetical, and that is to um, to reiterate that this is for educational purposes only and that you should not be trading along with me in real time live with real money and if anything should only be um, <clears throat> on your side uh, if you're uh, mimicking my actions be using a hypothetical account as well. Clearly that's for legal purposes and uh, with that in mind we'll go ahead and get started. So it's, it's good to see everybody. How's everybody doing today and tell me what's going on in your world forex. What, uh, what are you seeing right there? Um, anything that's uh, really sticking out right now that uh, that you uh, that you want to uh, just uh, talk about really quick before we go ahead and get started? Any um, any amazing occurrences or big headaches that you've had to deal with? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay, I guess not. Um, is uh, by the way, is my uh, Volume okay. Everything's coming through loud and clear. Everybody can hear me fine. Let me get started here right away. Okay, great. Good to see you, George, Ed, Carpy, or Cappy. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, before we go ahead and get started here, you'll notice that uh, what I've put up here is a um, um, is a PDF on um, trading multiple CCI time periods. I'm sure if everybody remembers, a few weeks ago I did a uh, quick webinar on uh, multiple CCI time periods, which shows how to actually um, use CCI both on a long and short term basis to identify trends, to rule out uh, false signals with CCI. And uh, I've compiled a report for FX Street, which I believe should be live um, either maybe today or tomorrow or Monday. Uh, FX Street has it, so I think it just is a, a matter of time. And of course, if they're as busy as I am, it might take a day or two. And with that, I've also provided the meta um, editor and meta trader code for you as well. And so you'll be able to um, simply grab that code, drop it into meta trader, and then you'll have that custom indicator. And in the report, I actually show you exactly how to trade uh, that uh, that code. So um, that should be pretty unique for you because the code is um, is I actually developed it myself and. Um, it should uh, be something that you aren't really able to get out anywhere else. And so uh, the PDF itself will also show you exactly how to use those two different CCI time periods. And I think what you'll find are some pretty neat stuff. And then, of course, later in the month, uh, we'll do another webinar to explain all of that. But it'll give you a couple of weeks to digest it. So with that in mind, we'll jump straight into our volatility and probability. Um, I just just out of curiosity, and uh, please remember that uh, I I really strongly encourage all comments and all um, discussion because uh, for you to get the absolute most out of this, uh, it's important that you ask questions wherever possible, and also give me your comments and thoughts, of course. Okay, great. Um, how many people here are using any volatility and probability in their day-to-day -day trading? Uh, do we have anybody who's and probability in the stance 
of attempting to um, identify and understand where and how technical moves will begin and end. And, um, and let's talk about the VIX for a moment. What, what is the VIX, really quick? Um, can anybody tell me exactly what it is, Ed? The VIX, per se, um, average true range, um, that is slightly, that's on the right track. And I'm going to just disconnect the camera here for one moment, and I'm going to move screens um, just to show you the, what the VIX really is. And uh, this is important. The, the VIX itself um, is, is not just a range. What, what the VIX is and what, what is, um, I think, really important to note here is that the, no, the, the VIX is actually a measurement of option premiums. And in that, it's a measurement of option premiums. It's meant to track fear. And the reason why is because at times when fear begins to start to escalate, option premiums will increase uh, because the riders of the calls or puts will want to be paid more for taking on excess risk of their strike prices being hit. And so the VIX is truly a measurement of fear and fear only based on option premiums. And so what we can do is um, what, there's a couple important things to note about the VIX really quick. And um, what you're seeing right here is I just jumped over to stock chart really quick. And I am planning on talking about the VIX, but we will really quick because it is important and it's something that you must really know. Um, the VIX, as you can see, um, when we really started to see the global financial crisis unfold, the VIX itself uh, really began to spike up into the VIX area. Well, what's important to note is that really, truly, what, what the VIX is telling us is that when the VIX uh, is trading above the average range of 40, then the riders of options uh, believe that there is enough excess risk in the market that they will demand higher option premiums uh, for obviously taking on the risk of riding those options from the get-go. So when we start to see the, the VIX decline, what it means is those option premiums are compressing and um, basically, those uh, option guys believe that uh, they can charge less for that risk because the chances on seeing extreme volatility moves uh, is much less. So the VIX really only applies to equity markets. However, we can take the information. And when we do begin to see dramatic spikes in the VIX, uh, we can assume that, that volatility within FX markets will also be excessive. So what we want to do when we look at the VIX is we really only want to use the VIX as a, um, as a gauge of, of larger swings in equity markets, which will um, conversely trigger uh, larger swings within FX markets based on the fact that people will either be buying or selling currencies uh, on a predetermined flight risk, meaning that they're going to either leave equities and move into treasuries or move out of treasuries and move into equities. And that's why we've seen a, a higher than normal correlation between the Dow Jones Industrial Average and uh, the US dollar lately. OK, so with that in mind, we're going to just skip out of the VIX. Um, what, what's important to note, though, is what volatility and probability really is is um, it, it is a measurement of, of probability that uh, a, a particular equity pair, or excuse me, currency pair, will actually be trading in, in, a, in a, a certain range on a day-to-day -day basis. And if at any time volatility begins to expand while we're uh, beginning to trend, then what we can assume is that that trend will continue. However, if volatility compresses, then we can also assume that um, that that trend will will stand significant chance of of um, of um, stopping and at least consolidating before deciding which direction to go. And I'm going to show you exactly how to identify this on a technical basis on your charts on a day to day basis. And they, by the way, the information that you're going to get here right now is not really offered out there by anybody else in the market. This is true professional trading and um, and a lot of this, uh, some of these concepts were derived um, from my time on the floor of the CBOE as a trader there, and then um, henceforth forward. A lot of trial and error has gone into this. A lot of time uh, spent with uh, um, EC Trader in Guangzhou, China. And um, I actually spent all of November there uh, coding some algorithms, volatility and probability algorithms with them. And then I've actually been working with them every single night um, over the last few weeks to finish up those algorithms. So. 
this is um, some uh, really kind of, it seems high level, but with a little bit of common sense, you can apply this on a day-to-day -day basis within your FX trading, and I'm pretty sure you're going to start to see amazing results right away. And the reason is, is because volatility and probability is a forward indicator. It's not a lagging indicator. Most technicals are a lagging indicator in that you have to wait for an event to already occur before you can actually take a position. However, um, the way volatility and probability is calculated, or at least the way we're going to do it today, so you can uh, just get it today on a simple, easy to understand level, is we are going to um, use Bollinger Bands, but they're not really Bollinger Bands, and I'll go through that in just a moment. They're, they're measurements of volatility and probability within a distribution that, um, that uh, really indicate the total width or breadth of a distribution and give us a probability of where um, the trading range should be. But because of within Bollinger Bands, and this was a natural effect, um, because Bollinger Bands, um, when, when we calculate a standard deviation, we have to square the exponent. Don't worry about the math. Um, when we square the exponent, what happens is we create a multiplier effect in the actual technical indicator. And so when volatility starts to pick up, the, um, the, the larger width or breadth, the total wingspan of the distribution will expand naturally as well, providing you with a forward-looking indicator. This is something that no other indicator does. It does not require an event that has already happened in the past for you to perceive what could happen in the future. And that's why um, the volatility and probability models are far and above anything else out in the market right now because we're not just chasing indicators, which is really kind of the joke um, between a lot of uh, professional traders and the guys in China that I spent all of November with. I mean, they just kidded about it right and left about how the market and the whole EA market, um, all the people who are basically trying to find the system are just chasing lagging events in hope that there'll be enough self-fulfilling prophecy that something will occur in the future. What you're going to get here, though, is a um, is an event that actually will will perceive and give you some indication of something that has yet to actually happen. Um, is it stronger than price action, or it's derived from price action? So initially, volatility is focused and expanded into the future. Yes, volatility expands into the future. And um, let's wait on the second question there, Ed, because I think I'll answer it naturally here in just a few moments. Okay, so to start here. Uh, if you read this report, it'll kind of explain everything about why descriptive statistics matter. Uh, it's not complicated stuff. Please don't feel like it's going to be a lot of a lot of hard math. It's not. It's really just common sense. And if you take the time to actually read these two reports, you're going to see some amazing things. Within within um, any any type of um, l let me just back up for a moment. The reason why we're using descriptive statistics from the get go is because statistics are statistics are statistics. And um, probability algorithms are algorithms are algorithms, or uh, probability formulas are just simply there for a reason. When you take data, regardless of whether you're attempting to measure market data or whether you're attempting to uh, measure a sample space, say you're a drug company, how you're actually going to analyze that data, it's the same thing. Data is data is data is data. And all of the prints and ticks that you're seeing on a daily basis surface within FX markets is just data. And if we take that data and we actually take and analyze it from the same, um, if sort of a little bit, but I, I think the, um, I think, I think the, um, I can never pronounce it right, Ichi, Ichimoku cloud um, is a forward projection, but um, it, it's sort of more of a, a linear projection that isn't quite as organic as um, using the, the uh, larger movement of distribution. So um, anyway, uh, the reason why we're using descriptive statistics is because like many technical models, like right now we're, we're starting to see a lot of technical indicators fail. We, we, it's because so many people are using the exact same thing. It, all stochastics and every single charting package everywhere comes with the exact same settings in it. And for the average retail trader who doesn't understand that you have to uh, like tweak the variables underneath it, what happens is they're all taking the same short positions when the 
uh, when, when stochastics crosses back below 80, and they're taking the same long positions when it crosses back above 20. And so what happens is then you get a tweak of, of movement or a little pop of volatility in the opposite direction. And every single one of those people's trades get tripped electron, or their stop orders get tripped electronically, and it creates an excessive amount of volatility. And then all of a sudden the, the, the trade goes, or the pair goes in the direction that they thought it would from the get-go, and they're, and they're, just left sitting there going, what just happened? Well, what happened is we're having excessive volatility within markets because too many people are using the same information. So it's not, um, the technical indicators are not a self-fulfilling prophecy anymore. They're actually um, a self-fulfilling, dangerous um, e indicator that almost um, ensures that, that half the time you're going to lose money if too many people are acting on the same information. So volatility, <clears throat> excuse me, volatility and probability, the great part about it is that regardless of whether volatility increases or decreases, descriptive statistics will organically um, change and move with the actual data that's being presented. So I don't want to get too technical here, but what's really um, um, got, well, Ed, what you have to understand is we're using the, the general premise of Gaussian um, but but really what you see on a day-to-day -day basis is both uh, Gaussian and Poisson distribution unfold within uh, markets. And and the, the real, um, I think the real question you're asking there is, is a Gaussian cloud failed in terms of uh, the, act, or the Gaussian curve failed in terms of um, how, how the information is presented on a chart on a day-to-day -day basis. And by the way, if, you, if you're not, if it, if it seems like I'm kind of jumping here and you're having a little bit of trouble, um, trying to see where all this is going or putting the information together, just bear with me and all of a sudden in about 15 minutes it's going to click and you're going to have a massive aha moment and you're going to see how powerful this stuff is. So um, Gaussian would, would be flawed in, in terms of market data if we assume that all of market data was a Gaussian curve. However, there's a thing called the central limit theorem and what the central limit theorem tells us is that we, if we take a small random subset of data within a larger uh, set of of, of uh, the larger uh, space of all data, the, the smaller subset itself will actually have a reasonably normal distribution. And, and that's actually proven within, um, within technical analysis in that we have a mobile mean. And I'm just going to switch screens to show you really quick here exactly what I'm talking about. If, if you're familiar with the moving average, and we're going to go ahead and just drop in um, some bands here so you can see exactly where I'm going. The, the, um, what's important for, for you to, um, to know here, and what we're going to do is we're going to put in um, just a 50-period um, uh, simple moving average with a 3.2 uh, standard deviation. And we're using 3.2 because there's a slight amount of data loss that will come from the equation itself. So the 0.2 actually helps us accumulate for, or uh, excuse me, accommodate for that, that slight bit of potential data loss. I'm going to make the actual moving average. What's this in it? Oh, those syndicated bracket in 15 minutes. I'm sorry, now, so I'm not sure if I understand your question. Um, where do, where do you see break in 15 minutes? Do you see a word break here? I actually I don't see the word break. I'm curious where you see that. Oh, up here. Yep, yep. For fractal. So, um, okay. Yep. Yeah, and um, just just ignore these two. They're they're actually um, some proprietary coding signals uh, based on volatility and probability with the China guys. So. Um, but uh, I just leave them running just to be able to monitor what's happening. So um, what we have here is what, what's important to know is we're, gonna, we're just going to use a four-hour chart here. And I'm going to switch screens really quick. I want, want you to please understand that what we're seeing here is not just a Bollinger Band. We're actually seeing a distribution. This is a distribution of data, three standard deviations from the mean. This is the mean right in the middle here, the larger line. So what we have is we could measure one. One, two, two, and three standard deviations. In terms of descriptive statistics, 
there is a uh, 60, 68 percent probability that all of the data will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. There is a, and we'll go ahead and just just put in the um, the other two um, other two standard deviations, just so you can see that that this is absolutely true. And we'll go ahead and just do colors here. We'll move these, and we'll make the first standard deviation just so it's readily identifiable for you. We will make the first standard deviation fire brick here. Not so brown, fire brick. Okay, there we go. And then we will insert one more set of uh, Bollinger Bands here. And we'll do steel blue on those, or regular blue, so you can identify them right away. And we will make the moving average. And we're going to make that at 50 and 2.2. .2. And then I'll, I'll go over all this with you. OK. So um, what we have here is um, we have a measurement of a distribution. So we have our, on a 50 period basis, we're just using, just to show you, uh, 50 period is the moving average. And then in blue, we have 2.2 .2 standard deviation. There's a 68% probability that all of the data will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. OK, everybody sees that. Um, basically, there's 68% of the time, almost all of the data will lie within one standard deviation of the mean. There is a 95% probability that all of the data will lie within two standard deviations of the mean. Does everybody see that? And then there is a 99.7% uh, probability that all of the data will lie within three standard deviations of the mean. Do you realize how true and accurate this is? If you take a look at this chart, you'll see, and let me just, um, I'm just going to expand this guy and move this over. You'll see that, that even if we just consider the, what's really happening in descriptive statistics, there's a 90, let me repeat that, 99.7% probability all of the data will lie within three standard deviations of the mean. Well, look at how many times uh, the uh, uh, pound yen actually breaches the third standard deviation. Just once, twice, three times here, and they're just quick tags, quick tags. Quick tag, quick tag, quick tag, quick tag. Do you see that what that means is that the statistical backing in the theory is so accurate. It's telling us that there's, I'm going to repeat it one more time, a 99.7% probability that all of the data will lie within three standard deviations of the mean. That is immediately verified visually on the chart as we see that it is so extremely rare that the that the yen or the pound yen, which is one of the most volatile pairs out there, can rarely ever breach the third standard deviation. The other thing, uh, the thick blue line is a 50 period moving average. The um, other thing to note here is that in cases where um, where the uh, pound yen begins to touch the uh, third standard deviation here. Notice that the entire distribution begins to move down. So what what this means here? What this means here is that I, sure I will, and I'll wrap all of that up in just a few moments here. If I um, stop now, I'm not going to get through this, and I really want to get all of the information to you guys because this is very powerful stuff, and I'm I'm thrilled to um, bring it to you because this has not really been brought out in the market anywhere. And I, for the average retail trader, I would love nothing more than to see you um, have some real information for once. So um, what, what we have here, what we have here is basically um, um, what, we're, what we're looking at. I think what most people are, are really kind of not, not, uh, not understanding um, Okay, great. And actually, Maude, I, I, I can't, um, I have to, uh, to catch a flight out of JFK in um, 45 minutes. Or excuse me, I have to leave for the airport in 45 minutes. So I have to wrap up on time. Um, okay, so we have, um, what we have here is, um, we have, a, a, 
what you will please understand is that we have one, two, and three standard deviations, one, two, and three standard deviations. But what we really have is a distribution. And, and what's so important to understand is that the distribution is moving. Do you see this? Do you see the distribution moving downward? It means that um, because of the central limit theorem and because we're taking a small subset of data um, in terms of the actual, um, in, in terms of uh, the, the larger uh, overall uh, linear progression of time, the small subset of data will always hold true because we have a mobile mean at the same time. And Ed, I'm going to show you that in just a moment. Uh, what we're, what we're going to do here really quick is I'm going to um, change all of the colors here, and I'm going to change all of these to blue. And the reason why I'm going to change all of these to blue is because I want you to identify that this is the 50-period uh, distribution. And so what we're going to immediately do here is we're going to take two time periods, two distribution time periods, and um, then we're going to overlap those on um, with a shorter distribution time period. And what you're about to see is pretty darn incredible. Okay, so um, please note that what we have here is the blue is the mean, the, the thick line is the mean, and then we have one, two, and three standard deviation. One, two, and three standard deviation. Everybody has that? Okay, now what we're going to do is we're going to um, insert uh, one more set, one more distribution with three standard deviations on both sides. And we'll do that uh, by going indicators, um, and I'll go ahead and just do, um, I have too many. OK, great. So what we're going to do here is we're just going to grab a 14 period, uh, a 14 period uh, distribution, or excuse me, a 14 period uh, Bollinger Band. And I'm going to set one at 3.2. And I'm going to do another one. And I'm going to set it at 2.2. And I'm going to make the colors, I'm going to make everything red. So it's easily identifiable. So you can spot it right out of the chute here. And we'll make all these red. And the reason why um, I'm just doing all of these with you, actually making these, um, is so you can see exactly how I do it. OK. OK, so um, I hope what everybody can see here is we have a um, 14 period distribution inside of a large 50 period distribution. Does everybody see that? And I'll make my chart just a little bit bigger so it's nice and clear. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert one more. Um, um, I'm going to insert one more uh, uh, Bollinger Band to make sure that we have uh, accounted for the the first standard deviation. And what you're about to see is pretty darn neat. Okay, so we will make this guy red too. And we'll put for our inputs, we're going to put 14 periods, and then we're going to put uh, 1.2, and click OK. OK, so what we have here is we have underneath our, um, underneath the surface, on a 50 period basis, we have our 50 period moving average. We have one, two, and three standard deviations. We have one, two, and three standard deviations. On a 14 period basis, we have one, two, and three standard deviations. One, two, and three standard deviations. Well, um, what we're really attempting to do here, <laughs> oh boy, and I, it, it does do that, that's for sure. Um, okay, so what we, um, what we have here is uh, basically a smaller subset of, of, of um, a smaller subset distribution underneath a larger distribution. And what, there's a couple important things to note here. First and foremost, if you're measuring 14 periods of data, should the distribution be wider or smaller um, than a larger distribution like 50 periods? Who, can anybody answer that? The, sub, the smaller subset distribution should always be smaller because you're, you're measuring less data. So that means that basically if you're measuring 50 periods, then obviously there's, there's more room for a greater uh, decline than in, in 14 periods uh, or, or greater ascension. 
which means that the 14 period distribution should, uh, in theory, always be smaller than the larger distribution. Well, here's the great thing about trading and actually applying this to um, our markets. What, what happens is because of the multiplier effect in the formula, because of the squaring of the exponent, and again, you don't have to worry about the math, just to understand the theory. Because of the squaring of the exponent, what it means is that when we look at those, those standard deviations, the third standard deviation, as volatility kicks up, um, the distribution expands. Does everybody see that? Everybody sees that the distribution expand? Okay, great. Now what we're going to do is I'm going to go ahead and um, delete a few indicate. I'm going to delete the, the first and the second standard deviation, the first and the second standard de de deviation. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because um, I want you to be able to see exactly what's happening here without too much confusion. As you just said, you need 3D glasses. And I think in another webinar, somebody called this spaghetti. But you know what? It's profitable spaghetti. So. Um, Okay, so we'll go 3.2, and then we will get rid of this guy here. Okay, so what we're left with here is we're left with uh, the same two distributions, but but what we have here is we're just showing we got rid of the first and second standard deviation in both distribution, and now we're actually just showing and actually excuse me. What we want to do is we want to just bring this down to 2.2. So we're going to show the 50 period 2.2 standard deviations. And then we're going to show um, the 14 period at 3.2 standard deviations. Everybody sees that? OK. Well, under the general theory that short term volatility should always stay within long, uh, well, should stay underneath, collapsed within long term volatility. Short term volatility should stay collapsed underneath long term volatility. In theory, that's the way things should be in a perfect world. What it tells us is that when short term volatility begins to expand, then obviously something within uh, the shorter term movement is creating. Uh, 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 basically a distribution uh, paradigm shift or aka a potential trending movement looming. And, and here is what is so beautiful. Now watch this. What you're going to see here is um, basically we have uh, the, the pound yen on a, actually we'll go down to the four, I'm going to actually go way down here I, because I want you to be able to trade this on a shorter term time frame. Um, so you can basically not have to worry about huge moves. Now, now look at this. What we have is we have a situation where uh, basically short-term volatility, as you can see denoted in the red chart right here, short-term volatility, or in the red lines, short-term volatility had expanded outside of long-term volatility. And then short-term volatility began to contract. Everybody sees that. What this means is that, that um, parity is returning and that short-term volatility collapsing back beneath long-term volatility means that um, volatility overall is, uh, is lessening. And when volatility begins to compress, it means the likelihood or probability of a distribution movement becomes less and less. Let me say that in another uh, phrase that I think will, will ring clear. When short-term volatility compresses below long-term volatility, lateral trading or consolidation will ensue. However, then when uh, we begin to see um, short-term volatility spike outside of long-term volatility on both sides, trending will begin, yes, a bias change. And trending will begin again. And if you take a look at the pound yen here, you'll notice that we had a, a spike in volatility. And I'll mark these right here. We had one here, and we had another spike in volatility down here. And our top side volatility stayed out all the way. And this, um, just by simply watching short-term volatility and understanding that the pound yen, see, this is a, a false indicator. This looks like a shooting star to most people. But for the seasoned volatility and probability trader, he or she would know that short-term volatility is still expanding and that trending stands a, a significant chance of, of continuation. 
and and that's why volatility and probability will kick the pants out of every single trader who attempts to chase indicators because it's given me a forward looking bias instead of having to look at a lagging event and i know that until short term volatility begins to contract that i should keep a trending bias long so um what you'll see here is that we can also go down into our shorter term time frames and and start to look at what's happening on a 5 minute chart we know that that uh volatility is still expanding everybody sees that And what we'll do there, we know volatility is still expanding. So what we're going to do is we are going to buy. And we are going to buy until top side volatility actually rolls over. And of course, just because we're protective traders, we're going to be careful and we're not going to take on too much excessive risk. So we'll drop in a stop here. Okay. And then on the one minute chart, what I didn't do there, what, but what you should do is, is you need to, before you take a position, you need to always look at the short term volatility as well. Because we can see what's happened here is short term volatility has collapsed. So on a one minute chart, if I was a scalper, I would be looking for consolidation here. Does everybody see that? So, so truly, because I took this position on the five minute chart, even though volatility is expanding, my risk has increased because I did not wait for short term volatility to be on my side as well. You want to wait for the one minute chart to basically confirm a volatility uh, breakout de before taking the position, actualizada. which of course I just didn't, but uh, obviously I have to move pretty quickly here to try and relay all of the information. So with that in mind, what we'll do is we'll protect uh, our position here. We'll just go ahead and close that guy right there. And then we will um, take just a little bit of money off the table there. And then we will wait for short-term volatility to compress. And again, what I think is important to, to show you right now is that, I, you know, I mean, I'm trading live here. That I, you know, I don't know how many um, presenters are, are willing to kind of put their money where their mouth is, but what I'm telling you is that this stuff works, and it works in real time. And I don't have to study historical information. I can look at it to see what's happening as the market unfolds. So we can see that I knew that um, basically you, I saw me close that just now because short-term volatility collapsed underneath long-term vol volatility right here. And so on a one-minute chart basis, I want to keep an eye, or excuse me, on a, on a five-minute chart basis, of course, I'm going to keep an eye on long-term volatility. And let me just collapse this window a little bit. I'm going to keep an eye on my longer-term volatility to make sure that longer-term volatility continues ascending. And as long as vol long-term volatility is ascending, then all I'm going to do is I'm going to go down into the one-minute chart. And you can see that right now we're starting to see massive consolidation. Well, what does that mean to me? Um, as a volatility and probability trader. It means that I'm looking for a breakout. And as soon as I start to see volatility expand again, I'm going to take position in the direction of the trend because volatility will likely continue uh, to promote uh, an ascending move in that trend. And notice that we see volatility now um, expanding, expanding, or excuse me, contracting. And we're starting to level out here. So um, what we really just want to see is short-term volatility expand outside of long-term volatility before taking our long position. It's going to give us some um, inference and guidance into what could happen in the future instead of blindly taking a position right now. And obviously, everybody here is fully aware um, that, uh, that, that all too often when we take a position, even with the trend within um, FX markets, there's a significant chance of excess volatility kicking in on the other side as every um every basic um every every chasing indicator trader uh piles in based on on the same information and I'm going to show you exactly what I mean right now if we take a look at um simply just an oscillator and we'll just uh take a look at at two here we'll grab our just basic um uh, MACD and then we'll also grab our basic, um, how about stochastics? I think that'll work. And we'll do, just do all the presets right out of the chute here. And let me collapse this window just a little bit. <clears throat> 
we can see that what's happening here is both are starting to roll over. And so if, if you were a, um, if you were a MACD trader uh, or a, um, or a, um, or a stochastics trader, chances are you're probably thinking that momentum is really rolling over here. And, and likely, because most traders are truly contrarians, um, especially when they're just kind of learning FX, they're, they're probably thinking that they're looking for the big move down, the big move down. Everybody wants to catch the big reversal. Well, you know, the sad part is, is, is the real money isn't made by catching the contrarian moves in opposite directions. It's just taking money out of the sweet spot, trading with the trend. And so if we actually, um, this is a one minute chart, excuse me. If we, if we look at that, we'll see, okay, we're rolling over on this, on the, uh, five minute stochastic basis. And we look like we're topping out as far as the MACD histogram goes. Well, how many contrarian retail traders are taking positions right here and right up in here? Yeah, absolutely, Mike, you bet. And I'll, I'll show you that in just a few moments. Well, well, first of all, Mike, I can tell you, if, if, if we start to break out, and volatility has not expanded. Do you think if, if short-term volatility has not expanded and long-term volatility has, um, or excuse me, if, if short-term volatility has not expanded outside of long-term volatility, do you think it's a fake out? Do you think it's a head fake? Or do you think it's truly a breakout? This is, it's kind of a, a theoretical logic question, but one that, that, uh, that I think needs to be addressed. Of exactly, it's a fake out because a move cannot continue without volatility expansion. Volatility must continue to travel at an elevated distance before an exaggerated um, jagged move can continue in one direction. So if we look at our one minute chart here, um, this is where it, I think it's, it's pretty cool and I'm, I'm hoping you'll really kind of see the, um, the worth and the merit and what's going on here is, is look, we, we all of a sudden start to see our short-term volatility compressing, compressing. And look at what happened before when, when volatility compressed and we, we um, only have about three or four minutes left before I need to run. When volatility compressed, 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 we start to move and look what happened. We start to move. Volatility compresses. Volatility expands. We start to move. Does everybody see that? How how brilliant and beautiful is that? And so right here, you want to talk about a head fake. How many people um, have ever tried to trade with the trend and you just can't time that entry right? You just can't get in at the right place. Well, well, this is going to save you from the endless guessing. All you have to do is just watch your short-term volatility, even on a one-minute or a five-minute basis when a trend is in effect, and begin to look for um, for a larger move. And now look, you can see short-term volatility rolling over here. Short-term volatility rolling over here. Look at what happened the last time short-term volatility rolled over. We just compressed and went sideways. All the way until volatility broke out again. And so all we have to do, all we have to do is just keep an eye on short-term volatility versus long-term volatility. And um, this is really, you know, just kind of the, the very first even scratch of the surface of, of this theory. But it's, it's stuff really is, I, you know, I, I have not seen it anywhere else. And, um, you know, by, but the great thing about volatility and probability is that even if the market changes, it won't change. It will not change. Volatility and probability is um, just the simple measurement of data within descriptive statistics, so it won't change when market conditions change. In fact, volatility and probability will be um, your sort of leading indicator to when market conditions are changing. And so what we have here is we, instead of just chasing indicators, we're finally putting something on our side that will shift and will, will change organically with the market when markets change because that's why most systems, most EAs and most traders fail is because when markets change paradigms, they cannot also. Well, volatility and probability will remain a constant throughout time because it's simply uh, descriptive statistics and the measurement of the data that unfolds within. So if there's two things that I want you to take away from this webinar, is simply, um, please just remember that what I'm using here is a, and I'll just pull them up really quick before um, we exit.
is what we're using is a 14 period uh, Bollinger Band at 3.2 standard deviations, and they are not Bollinger Bands, by the way, they're volatility buy-in. And that's why this, this information hasn't been related to the market very well, is because they were named wrong from the get-go, and then they lost their true meaning. They're, they're, they're volatility bands, they're measurement of standard deviations, of distribution compression and expansion. They're not Bollinger Bands. John Bollinger is an idol of mine, but he totally screwed up the market by naming them after himself. So um, then we also have a 50 period at 2.2 standard deviations. And we see what we've done is we've, we're using the 2.2 standard deviations because we're bringing our overall measurement of long-term volatility in just a little bit. Otherwise, at 3.2 standard, uh, standard deviations, it would be almost too wide for us to uh, correctly and um, accurately predict uh, a, a volatility breakout. So, so by bringing that into 2.2 and um, and uh, bringing the uh, the the 14 period out to uh, 3.2, we we can assume that um, we can assume that that we're actually um, giving our distributions uh, the correct amount of distance needed to be able to identify the volatility breakouts. So um, now, what I want you to notice here is that instead of using a trend line, basically if we just identify a, a point of, um, of, of, of break, of breach, of volatility, what we can do is we can identify where our top side volatility has, um, has stalled at. And you, you'll notice here that top side volatility has actually stalled at, and again, this, this is going to go against everything else that you've learned in your trading career and everything that, that everybody else teaches you about support and resistance. Because what we know here is that if the pound yen begins to attack short term, the the um, incident would denote a volatility uh, distribution expansionary movement, and so we can get long in here at one spot three three five eight, while the rest of the world, all of the breakout traders of the world, are waiting till up here to get long. See, we're 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 already in the trade because uh, the position because the pound yen has attacked short term volatility um, almost 20 pips ahead of where everybody else is, and that's why every other people are buying up here, and then all of a sudden it starts to sell off, and they're going, "What happened?" It's because of the really really savvy traders already were in. In fact, they didn't wait till we 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 fought resistance and and they they just simply kept an eye on on volatility understanding probability and so um, clearly what what we we have to understand is that when volatility begins to um, short-term volatility begins to expand outside of long-term volatility and our currency is attacking short-term volatility on one side of the distribution or the other what we have is we have a teeter-totter if I turn this chart on the side and you and you really just could could look at the lines when when all of the weight is leaning to the left side of the teeter totter. Which side do you think the teeter totter is going to lean? It's going to lean to the left, not to the right. And so you can see right here we're starting to see the um, pound yen begin to break out, and or at least move upward. But we also see that volatility is still compressing. So there's no there's no reason for us to take a position here. Do you see how this keeps us from from making stupid mistakes and and getting falling victim victim to head fakes? Um, I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, taking position here just on a trade with a trend, you know, be able to get out when a pullback occurs. It's sure, it's, it's a reasonably high probability given the larger uh, movements that we're seeing here. But you know, then again, if you're an Elliott wave guy, you see one, two, three. Um, three waves up, and so you know, obviously that's going to leave a, a little bit to question as well. So um, now we can finally see a volatility starting to move out. We go over to our five-minute chart. We make sure long-term volatility is moving up. It is. We go back to the one-minute chart. We check and see, make sure our uh, one-minute volatility is still expanding, and it is. And as soon as we start to attack and move above uh, our our um, short-term volatility point, again, now by attacking volatility, we're going to look for a move here. Now, now here's here's what's great is that you don't have to um, buy the initial attack on short-term volatility. You can wait for the first pullback to the mean because if the trade is truly um, going to hold uh, hold weight, 
then then and if the ascending trend is truly going to continue then then we know that that basically the mean will continue to hold and of course we don't want to assume a position until we actually begin to truly attack short term volatility and you can see that we haven't done that yet which is why I haven't pulled the trigger and so um it's it's possible that we that we continue to see uh, consolidation here even on the one minute chart of the pound yen and what's so vital here is that the pound yen trades with a six to ten pip spread and obviously it can move 40 to 50 pips in a matter of seconds and so by using volatility and probability we can kind of defeat that 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 larger forex guessing game of, of trying to just chase indicators and again um, by the way I need to go here in actually right now so um, you guys, I, I do need to go. So um, I, I really want to want to thank everybody for their time here. If you if you please take the time to read, um, if you if you take the time to read the um, the two uh, reports on uh, volatility and probability that I've provided, and hopefully everybody can see my screen. Okay, can everybody see the PDF? Okay. Yeah, you betcha. Okay, great. Yeah, so so please take the time to um, read the um, please take the time to, to um, read the uh, the PDF, and then also on um, fxvolatility.com, um, we actually tomorrow night are launching um, some of the a signal service on some of the volatility probability models that I worked on in China. So that will be available to you as well, um, and I will just. Uh, bring up that website so you can see it really quick and um, and then also there's there's plenty of volatility probability information here as well so um, please take the time to visit me at FX volatility and of course the um, volatility stuff that I'm talking about is the actual vast system volatility adjusted for signal so um, and this obviously will have strength meters and then some uh, measurements of volatility, which will give you kind of an electronic overview of what I just showed you, so you don't have to do all of the work. But anyway, please remember that volatility and probability will not change. And um, instead of chasing indicators, put something on your side for once. Just please um, don't don't fall victim to just chasing the stock settings in in most technical tools because it's a losing game. Okay, great. Well, uh, you guys have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you next week. Thank you so much, Mark.